Okay. Today we're going to talk about constraint satisfaction problems. Actually, there's hardly going to be any theorems in this lecture. A lot of definitions. Maybe you've seen them before, but uh, it's going to be a topic we'll talk about periodically for the rest of the class. So we should uh, get started on it today. So I guess in this crowd, probably most of you have heard of constraint satisfaction problems before. So I'll be a little bit brief. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, so here are some examples of constraint satisfaction problems that you may well have heard of. Uh, you know, like max 3sat. So here you're given a CNF formula of width at most 3. And you're trying to find an assignment for the variables that satisfies as many of the clauses as possible where max cut. This is you're given like an undirected graph and you want to partition the vertices into two parts to maximize the fraction or the number of edges that have one vertex, one endpoint in each part. Here's one called max E3 lin. In this one, you're given a bunch of uh, linear equations over the field F2. Something like this is a typical example. This is mod 2. And uh, the E3 stands for the fact that there are exactly three variables in each constraint. Um, for example, if I had written E3 sat here, that means every clause has exactly three literals in it. And uh, here's one more, just to give you an example, where you have a constraint satisfaction problem not over the Boolean domain. In the problem max three coloring, you're given a graph, and you have to color it with three colors, uh, the vertices. It might not be three colorable, so your task is to nevertheless color it so that as few edges, or let's say as many edges are bichromatic as possible. OK, so all of these problems, I mean, these are classic examples of optimization problems that are studied in uh, computer science. And all of these fit into a common framework of uh, the CSP, or constraint satisfaction problems. OK, so in uh, a generic CSP, it has the following ingredients. You have a domain, omega, which is the, I mean, OK, what's common to all of these things is you have like a bunch of variables that you're trying to assign with values to satisfy a bunch of given constraints. So the domain is where the values come from. So in here, they're all, it's like a binary domain, you know, true or false or left and right, or 0 and 1 here. And here, the domain is of size 3. It's like red, green, or blue, or something. OK, so this is, um, let's say often it's going to be 0 or plus or minus 1 for us, but not always. And you have a set of predicates, or these are like the types of constraints. OK, so this is really, uh, it's a, a set, let's say capital Psi. And each, let's say, little Psi in the set is a function or a predicate um, from some small number of copies of the domain into 0, 1. OK, and this R is called the arity of the predicate. Um, and the overall, the arity of the CSP is the, the maximum arity of all the predicates that are involved. OK, so let me explain to you. This is maybe a bit unclear, but you see in each of these things are sort of different kinds of constraints that are allowed. So let me explain uh, how each one fits into this framework. OK, so in max 3 sat, uh, the domain is a binary. And you can call it, I don't know, true or false if you like. Remember here, you're given, I mean, when you think about max 3 sat normally, you're given like a bunch of clauses that might look like, you know, x1 or x3 bar or x5, and like x2 bar or x7 bar, and so forth. OK, so the, in max 3 sat, the kinds of constraints or predicates are disjunctions of up to three literals. So in this case, uh, can anybody tell me how many different predicate types are allowed? What's the cardinality of the associated sets? No? 
too much addition at this time of day? It's um, 14 because uh, you have eight uh, different size three disjunctions and four different size two disjunctions and two size one disjunctions. Okay, so really, you know, there's, uh, I don't know, like, predicates you're allowed to apply to the variables xi uh, are, you know, everything like xi or xj or xk, oops, or xi bar or xj or xk, up to the one with like three bars, that's like eight choices, and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, so like in max cut, it's convenient. Okay, so in max cut, normally you think of it as being uh, defined by a graph, but it really fits into this framework. If you think of the vertices of the graph as variables that you're supposed to assign to two different sides. So we can think of the domain, we can call the sides plus or minus one. And then in max cut, the constraints are the edges. For each edge, you want ideally to cut it. So you want its endpoints to be assigned different values from the domain. So in max cut, this thing, set of predicates is just size one. The only predicate is the binary predicate, which is like the not equals predicate. Okay, it's the predicate that's true if its domain values are opposite to each other. So do you see how like max cut fits into this framework? Any questions about that? Okay, so uh, just to you know, go through the other ones, in max E3 lin, you know, the domain, you can think of it as F2 to the N, and there are two different predicates allowed, the ones that look like Xi plus Xj plus Xk equals zero, and the one with uh, equals one. And in max three coloring, the domain is of size three, maybe it's red, green, blue, and actually, just like in max cut, there's only one predicate, a binary predicate, the not equals predicate that maps red, green, blue, squared into zero or one. Okay, we said the predicate is satisfied if the output is one and not satisfied, in other words. Okay, one more notation I'll maybe eventually use. Uh, well, let me skip this notation for now. I'll just define it when I need it later. Okay, so, um, these are like the names, you know, for each choice of predicate set in the domain, that gives you an algorithmic problem, like uh, max three sat or max cut or what have you, okay? But that's like a mathematical problem. Uh, if you're designing algorithms, you then get like an instance of the problem or an input for the problem. Okay, so let's make that definition. And instance, or input for this uh, constraint satisfaction problem, which in general we might call max CSP with predicate set um, psi. Uh, let's call this instance script P. Uh, it has a variable set, okay, which often we denote x1 through xn, uh, is just a list of um, constraints and each constraint C has two parts, S and Psi, where Psi is one of the functions in the constraint set and S, the scope, is a tuple of variables uh, all distinct. And here R is the arity of psi. Okay, so constraint is a pair, it tells you which predicate you're applying and S the scope tells you which predicate or variables you're applying it to. So you need one for each 
uh, uh, arity of psi, and we're going to assume that they have to be di distinct variables. OK, so for example, if you think about max cut, then each constraint is just an edge. It tells you what the two variables are, two vertices are, and every time it's not equal. So you want to cut each edge. OK, and the list is actually, you know, I guess a multi-set, so you're allowed to have a constraint more than once if you feel like it's more important than the other constraints. OK, and naturally, you know, given an instance or a, a P, the associated algorithmic task is to find uh, an assignment to the variables of domain values to the variables so as to maximize the number of constraints that are satisfied. OK, so I'll write down yet another definition to encapsulate those words. OK, so an assignment. or a labeling uh, for an instance P is just a map F that maps the variable set into the domain. And we say that F satisfies a constraint Well, if the natural thing happens, I mean, if under this labeling f or assignment f, the constraint evaluates to 1. OK, so if psi of f of s equals 1. OK, and really this is shorthand for f of v1 through f of vr, if s the scope is like this. It's hard to get that temperature exactly right. Um, okay. And as I said, you know, the goal algorithmically, given such an instance, is to find an assignment that satisfies as many constraints as it can. And it's slightly more convenient to look at a fraction of constraints that are satisfied, because then it's sort of normalized to a number between 0 and 1, regardless of how many constraints are in P. Uh, so we say that the, the value of an assignment, F, <coughs> on an instance p is the fraction of constraints satisfied or you may also write it as the expected value if you choose a random constraint from p of psi of f of s okay and here it's a it's I'm using the fact that it's a little convenient that, you know, I sort of define predicates to be like functions that output 0 or 1. So they're 1 if it's satisfied and 0 otherwise. So this will give you the, the fraction of constraints satisfied. Okay, and it's often quite convenient, and we'll do this, to think of the instance not just as a list of constraints, but as like a probability distribution over constraints. Does that make sense? In fact, in general, sort of perfectly fine to allow your predicates to not just output like 0 and 1, but to output like a real number between 0 and 1 to express like, I don't know, the extent to which they're satisfied or like a number of points you get for each different possible assignment. And then this general definition just generalizes immediately, but for simplicity, we'll stick to predicates that are either satisfied or not satisfied. Okay. That's good. So uh, what are you shooting for? You see, there's always going to be a, a, a best or several best assignments. These are called the optimal assignments. And in, in general, you write opt of P for just the maximum over all assignments of the value. OK, and, uh, often we're interested in instances where the opt is 1. Uh, in other words, it's possible to satisfy all the constraints. And we call, we say that P is satisfiable in this case. OK. 
So that's all the definitions I want to make for a little while. OK, so this is familiar stuff from the theory of, I don't know, algorithms or optimization. Actually, I want to make one notational note here. Um, you see, if you look at, let's say, an instance of three, lin, three variable linear equations, usually it might be written like something like this, like x1 plus x4 plus x8 equals 0, x2 plus x7 plus xn equals 1, and dot, dot, dot. You know, this may be your instance p. Uh, and that's how you write it in like elementary algebra. But it's kind of better for us to not write it like this because it can lead to some confusion. Like if I say, hey, here's an instance, and then you like uh, consider the assignment where x1 is 1 and x4 is 0 and so forth. Then it's confusing because there's like, it's unclear the distinction between like the variable and the value the variable is taking. Okay, so we need to make sure we disambiguate this. So, you know, the variables will continue to be named like xi, but we're going to prefer to write like our instances with the assignment name like built in. So I would rather write it like this. Okay, so still the x's are the names of the variables, but like I'll just write the instance like this. So now it's more clear that like you're trying to find a function f that maps the set of variables, the x's, into 0 or 1 to maximize the number of satisfied constraints. Okay, good. All right, so why am I talking about this today? I thought we were in the middle of a, or we were supposed to be in the middle of discussing property testing and uh, PCPPs and dictator testing and so forth and so on. Um, well, I, I bring it up because of the following important connection between CSPs and string testing algorithms. And that connection is the following. A uh, CSP instance is exactly the same object as a string tester. Okay, so there, there it is. I'll even put a box around it in red. All right, so that might not look completely obvious, but I will now justify to you why it's the case. So you see, what's going on in like string testing algorithms and in CSPs? So like in CSPs, you have some variable set V. All right, so there's like x1, x2, up to let's say xn, and these are the variables. And um, you know, you're trying to find some assignment f that maps them into some domain. Um, so, you know, you're trying to find like some string f of x1, f of x2, through f of xn. Okay, and implicitly you have some kinds of constraints on like, I mean the p looks like a bunch of constraints on these things. So like v1 of like maybe f of x1, f of x4, f of x7 equals 1, and then you have some v2 of f of x2, whatever. Well, they should all supposedly equal 1. Okay, and in CSP, you think to yourself, well, there are these like slots, and like given an assignment f that kind of makes, you know, actual domain values, this is an element of omega to the n, you know, I'm interested in what fraction of these constraints get satisfied. Okay, and a very similar thing is happening in the case of string testers, right? So in string testers, you have like some unknown string, w, but you may think of this also as an element of omega to the n. And the tester does what? Like, the tester has some internal randomness, which it uses to choose like one of a bunch of, well, for each outcome of its randomness, it will select some indices, maybe like, you know, W1, W4, and like W7, and then it'll decide to accept or reject based on some function of, you know, the domain elements it got back from its queries, okay? So it applies some predicate to these string entries or characters that it reads, and 
you know, accepts or rejects based on whether or not that's true. In other words, if you think about like the actions of a string tester, just like, let's say it uses s random bits, like enumerate all the 2 to the s things it can do based on its random bits, and each of those looks like this. It like queries an entry of the word, and like applies some predicate to the outcomes, and then decides to accept or reject. So you see the picture is somehow exactly the same. I mean, it's really the same. A string tester for words over the alphabet omega and a, a CSP instance. So somehow, you know, in CSPs, you know, string tester for some word and omega to the n, you know, you have this notion of the value of an assignment f, and that's like equivalent to, you know, the probability that the tester accepts w. Okay, so somehow a w here corresponds to an assignment over here. Okay, and for example, what does the arity of the CSP correspond to? Yeah, it corresponds to the, you know, the, the max number of queries made by the tester. What else have we got? So in CSPs, you're very often, you pay a lot of attention to the set of predicates that are allowed on the left-hand side. We didn't think about that too much before with string testers, but we will. So, I mean, here it's like the set of predicates, the tester mm, applies, you know, to the query outcomes to make its decision. We didn't think about that very much before. We just sort of mostly counted how many queries it made. But later we're going to we're going to start thinking about this more refined question of also what predicates the tester uses to make its accept reject decisions. Okay, and you can actually think of you know, given us for example, just another comparison. You know, if I give you the description of a string tester, you might ask yourself which word passes or, you know, is accepted with the highest probability. And that's the same question that you typically ask yourself in CSPs. Given a CSP instance, which value, sorry, which assignment has the highest value? Okay, so it's the exact same concept in different guises. And uh, we're going to exploit that. Any questions about that? By the way, I mentioned last time when we were talking about uh, PCPP reductions that, you know, PCPP reduction was an object that took a, a circuit as input, which implicitly defined a, a, a property, the set of all strings that the circuit accepted, and it was supposed to output a string tester that had this PCPP uh, property. And I said, you know, if you think about outputting a string tester, just imagine you output the whole description of what it does, but now we can see what it's really just outputting is outputting a CSP, okay? A CSP where the variables are like the entries of the, the word that's being tested. Okay, so, good. So as an example, let's take our favorite, well, let's take a string tester that we're familiar with. So one string tester that we're familiar with is well, we also know that every function tester is also a string tester. So one example of a string tester is the BLR test. Remember this linearity test? Okay, and this corresponds under this correspondence to an instance of a CSP. In particular, think about what the BLR linearity test does, given an unknown function. Um, it decides three queries, uh, strings to query it on, like x, y, and x plus y, mod 2. And then it gets back the results, f of x, f of y, f of x plus y, and checks that they sum to 
0 mod 2, that f of x plus f of y equals f of x plus y. So that predicate itself is uh, a three-line predicate. Okay, so this corresponds to an instance of the max, we may write, E3 lin CSP. And if this is for functions, let's say on n variables, then this is an instance of max 3 lin uh, with 2 to the n variables. Okay, and the, the names of these variables are, you know, the, I mean, vectors in F2 to the N. Okay, so if we were to, I don't know if I can make this clear, if we were to write down, let's consider the BLR test with little n equals 2, what would the associated E3 lin instance look like? Well, in this picture, it would look like, you know, uh, one possible outcome is x is 0, 0, and y is 0, 0, so then you look at x plus y, which is also 0, 0, and you check that's equal to 0. Okay, so this is like x, this is y, this is x plus y. Okay, you might choose 0, 1 for the first string, and maybe 1, 1 for the second string. So the third string, therefore, is, I guess, 1, 0, and you check that those add up to 0. Okay, and I guess there will be, like, 2 to the 2n constraints. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, so for example, if you're viewing this as a kind of in the constraint satisfaction problem mentality, your first instinct is to ask, okay, which function passes this test with the highest probability? Okay, and in fact, we know that, you know, by analyzing the linearity test, what we sort of saw is any function or assignment that is a linear function has value one. It satisfies all the constraints, and in fact, the only assignments that have value 1 are the linear assignments. And the only assignments that have value close to 1 are the ones that are close to linear assignments. Okay. All right, so um, let's talk about algorithms a little bit more. Eventually, this will all get back to analysis of Boolean functions, but we're going to talk about computational complexity a little bit. Uh, so for all of these algorithms problems that, you know, you're given a graph, you want to find the maximum cut, you're given a three-side instance, you want to find the assignment that satisfies as many clauses as possible, uh, all these problems are NP-hard. I mean, for almost any uh, uh, CSP, the problem of finding an assignment which achieves the optimum is NP-hard. Um, Okay, that's disappointing. So uh, one uh, thing you can do from an optimization perspective is relax the goal of trying to find the optimal assignment and just try to find a pretty good assignment that satisfies a lot of the constraints. So here's the definition along those lines of, uh, let's say, an approximation algorithm. So let's let alpha be less than or equal to beta. And we'll say an algorithm a is an alpha out of beta approximation algorithm. Uh, for a given CSP, if it has the following guarantee, on all instances where the best assignment has value at least beta, in other words, where instances where the opt is at least beta, the algorithm 
is guaranteed to get at least alpha. Okay. So, I mean, the ideal thing would to have would be to have like a beta comma beta approximation algorithm because that means you know, if the optimum is beta, then your algorithm will find an optimal solution. But as we know, that's NP-hard for almost all problems, so that's asking too much. Okay, so just to get used to this notation, um, I'll give you examples of some examples of alpha beta approximation algorithms. I imagine most of you have seen this stuff before, so I'll go a little quickly. Okay, so for all beta between a half and one, uh, half out of beta approximating the max E3 Lin problem is easy. Okay, there's like a very efficient polynomial time algorithm for this. Remember, in max E3 lin, everything is like a linear equation mod 2 with three variables. The right-hand signs could be either 0 or 1. And uh, this is very easy, in fact. Just output the better of f is constantly 0 or f is constantly 1. Okay, that's a ridiculous kind of algorithm, but... Uh, you either have at least half zeros on the right-hand side or at least half ones on the right-hand side. And whichever you have more of, just output the constantly, a constant assignment which has that value. Okay, and then you'll get a satisfied equation uh, whenever your output matches the right-hand side. Okay, so regardless of whatever the optimum is, you can always get at least half by this totally trivial algorithm. Okay. Uh, here's another fact. Um, let's say 1 comma 1 approximating max 3 sat is NP hard. And this statement is identical to like the classic statement from like the very first course in computational complexity that says like 3 sat is NP hard. Because if you decipher what the parameters mean here, this is the algorithmic task of, even if I give you an instance of 3SAT where it's possible to satisfy 100% of the clauses, it's NP-hard for you to come up with an assignment that satisfies 100% of the clauses. Okay, so that's the usual meaning of the statement 3SAT is NP-hard. And so it says, in our notation, one, one, 1 out of 1 approximating is NP-hard. Okay. Um, similarly, one out of one approximating max three coloring is NP hard because just uh, that's exactly corresponds to the classical statement that three colorability is NP hard. If I give you a graph and it is possible to legally three color it, it's nevertheless NP hard to find a, a legal three coloring one that makes 100% of the edges bichromatic. Um, on the other hand, for max 3 lin, this problem is not NP-hard. So, let's say even 3 lin, this is in poly time. So this is the problem. I give you a system of linear equations over F2, each having three variables at most, and sort of, you need an algorithm which, when the thing is completely satisfiable, finds a satisfying assignment. And that's an easy task um, in linear algebra. You can do this with Gaussian elimination, because it's like you're given a satisfiable system of equations over a field, F2, you can find a satisfying assignment. Okay, um, so that's 
uh, an easy case of three variable linear equations when you're given a satisfied instance, but as you probably know, if you're given like an overdetermined instance, one where like the, the best assignment does not satisfy everything, then if you just try to run Gaussian elimination, who knows what will happen. And in fact, um, this is also like a textbook statement for every beta between half and one, say beta, beta, approx beta out of beta approximating max, let's say three lin, is NP hard. Okay, so this is what's usually meant by the basic complexity theory statement, max three lin is NP hard. It more precisely means, well, it more precisely implies this. For any value beta which is not one, uh, you know, it's hard to find the best assignment, satisfying as many equations as is possible. Even if you know what the optimum is, if it's less than one. Okay, so all these hardness results and easiness results are kind of textbook facts. We're just going to start talking about non-textbook facts in a second. Uh, any questions about those, though? Pardon me? So, like, are any hardness results known, like, uh, getting less than beta? Yeah, we'll say some in a second. In fact, that's what we're driving at with all this dictator testing and property testing stuff. Getting stronger hardness results. Uh, just as an example of, like, a non-textbook, but true fact, there's a famous algorithm of Gomans and Williamson for the max cut algorithm, which, a problem which has the following guarantee for every Let's say for all beta, actually it's one algorithm with the following property. For every beta, it's uh, 0.878 times beta out of beta approximation for max cut. Okay, it's polynomial time too. Okay, so given any graph, no matter what the optimum beta is, it is guaranteed to find a cut that's at least 87.8% cuts at least 87.8% of the optimum fraction. Okay, and that's a highly non-trivial polynomial time algorithm. Okay, so, yeah, besides this connection between CSPs and string testers, why are we inserting all this talk of approximation of CSPs into this part of the course? Um, it's because all the, uh, there's all sorts of Great tools from analysis of Boolean functions for proving hardness of approximation results. So this says that giving, getting the optimum assignment to an overdetermined system is NP hard, but we would like to ideally even show that getting, let's say, 90% of the optimal number of uh, satisfiable equations is also NP hard. Okay, and this is where analysis of Boolean functions and uh, dictator tests and so forth will come in. Okay, so in fact, this, a theorem that we saw last time um, that was stated in very different language is actually equivalent to a, an interestingly strong hardness of approximation result. So there's a famous theorem in complexity theory called the PCP theorem. We saw a little variant of it at yesterday or last time. And I'll restate that for you in a second, but the classic version, the PCP theorem, is identically, exactly equivalent to the following statement. It's usually not stated in this language, but they're totally equivalent. There exists a universal constant delta naught greater than zero, such that one minus delta naught out of one approximating max, say, E3 sat, is NP hard. Okay, that's an equivalent statement of the PCP theorem. And so it's a strengthening, uh, it's like a very interesting strengthening of this guy. It says even if I give you a, you know, a 3CNF and I promise you it's totally satisfiable, 
it's NP hard to find an assignment that satisfies some 99.999% of the equations. Okay, in particular, it sort of says if you know what this terminology means, that you know there's no p task for max three set polynomial time approximation scheme unless p equals np. Okay, and you know last time we saw what I termed the PCPP theorem, which is stronger than the PCP theorem. So in particular, it implies this statement. And uh, I'll prove now this implication. This will be the only proof in this class. Well, I'll mostly prove it. What do you mean by the word universal? Oh, I just mean that like it doesn't depend on like n or anything. Like it's some number. It's unspecified. It's probably 10 to the minus 10 or something. But. Maybe with nine zeros, yeah, ten zeros. So somehow that doesn't seem like it satisfies you. Well, I guess like you know, in all these others, uh, like, does it make sense to talk about uh, an alpha that has an n? Yeah. Um. Yeah, you, it's not clear if our definition really allows for it, but one it can sometimes, one often it does want to be flexible and let's say allow alpha to depend on n or m. I mean, it's okay, usually n and m, m being, let's say, the number of constraints is implicitly defined. So, for example, you might also call this result, you know, 1 minus 1 over m, where m equals the number of constraints. Okay, so even if it's possible to satisfy all of the constraints. It's hard for you to satisfy, okay, I don't know, maybe plus a half or something, more than 1 minus 1 over m, but that's really just saying more than m minus 1 constraints. Um, but yeah, it, you, you, it is sensible to talk about, you know, these alphas, let's say, being as a function of n or m. I'll, in fact, say more about that eventually. Okay, so in order to prove this implication, I hope you remember the PCPP theorem. I'll try to sort of say it to you as we go along. Uh, so if you remember this PCPP theorem, it asserted that there was a PCPP reduction where the proofs of polynomial length. Okay, so what does that mean in a picture? Okay, so the PCP theorem implies there exists like a poly time PCPP reduction, which takes as an input a circuit C, which has n Boolean inputs, and it outputs, well, it outputs a, a three query tester. Uh, where this tester has access to two things. It has access to a word, w, of length n, which is supposed to be a satisfying assignment for this circuit, a circuit that makes the output one, and some proof, pi, of length poly n, okay, and in the, the version of the PCP P theorem that we proved, this length was 2 to the 2 to the n, but I told you that it's an exercise to get it down to 2 to the n, and it's a major theorem to get it down to poly n. Um, okay, and what does that tester look like? It's, it's a three-query tester which has access to these words. So, in particular, like, if you enumerate over the randomness of the tester, for each outcome of the randomness, it chooses three positions from these two things and queries them and applies some predicate to them. Okay, so it has, it looks like some predicate of, in fact, if you look into it, I'm pretty sure it takes always one bit from W and two bits from pi. So, I don't know, like W1, pi 7, <coughs> pi 8 equals 1, and maybe it has another one that's like, <coughs> Uh, 
some other predicate <coughs> equals 1. And what does it mean that it was a PCPP reduction? It meant the following two things. First of all, um, <coughs> if W is any word that satisfies C, then there uh, exists a pi such that 100% of these checks pass. The tester accepts with probability 1. On the other hand, stating the soundness part of the PCPP theorem in contrapositive, if you have some w and some pi, okay, so this has some rejection rates, sorry. Let's say lambda 0. <coughs> if you have some w and some pi, such that the tester accepts with probability at least 1 minus lambda naught times epsilon, then there exists a W prime satisfying C such that uh, W is close to W prime. Okay, and this was for all epsilon. Okay, so that's the second condition or the completeness condition of the PCPP system. Okay, so the PCPP theorem asserts that some reduction that makes a circuit and outputs this tester exists with these two properties. And furthermore, it's kind of an exercise to show that you can assume without loss of generality that all of these predicates on three positions are disjunctions. <coughs> okay, or if you don't believe that, you can just believe me when I assert that in the PCP th P theorem, the tester always uses disjunction predicates. So that means that actually these all look like constraints that look like, I don't know, this. W1 or pi 7 or pi 8 bar, W10 bar, or pi 5 or pi 100, etc. <coughs> okay, so this is the tester, and as we now know, that's equivalent to a CSP. In particular, it's equivalent to an a instance of max E3 set. Any questions about what's going on? Okay, so the PCP theorem, PCPP theorem asserts that this kind of reduction exists, and we essentially saw exactly that up to this condition of what three area predicate is used, uh, except it would have length 2 to the 2 to the n. <coughs> um, okay, so let's just look at what happens here. You see, we're trying to prove an NP-hardness result. And, uh, you know, we're trying to reduce basically from circuit set, which is, you know, the most canonical uh, NP-complete problem to this problem of 1 minus delta 0 out of 1 approximating E3 set. Okay, so I'm actually not being completely formal here, but you'll get the gist of it. Uh, what I want to say is, you know, basically this is saying that if there were a polynomial time algorithm that could do this, then by reduction there would be a polynomial time algorithm that could decide if a circuit is satisfiable or not. Okay, and that's a canonical NP-complete problem. And it essentially gives us evidence that you cannot do this in polynomial time. And so why does that work? Well, notice in this reduction, if C is satisfiable, And that implies that the opt of this instance that the reduction spits out is 1. Because if C is satisfiable, that means there is some word W which makes C1, so it's in the property defined by C. And therefore, we know there exists a proof pi such that the tester accepts with probability 1, i.e. all these checks pass. Okay, so that's that. And the other key claim I want to make is that the following, if the opt, well, let me write like this. If C is not satisfiable, I claim that the opt of P is less than 1 minus lambda naught, where lambda naught is this rejection rate 
in the explicit PCP reduction of the PCPP theorem. So why is this? Well, the contrapositive, let me write the contrapositive. Opt P at least 1 minus lambda naught implies C satisfiable. And this is going to be exactly like that thing we were discussing right at the end of the last lecture. It's a PCP theorem. So suppose opt P is at least 1 minus delta naught. That means it's like saying there exists some, you know, W star and pi star such that the tester accepts these things with probability at least 1 minus lambda naught. Okay, and you can write this as 1 minus lambda naught times 1 if you want. And so by this soundness condition, it means that there exists some W prime satisfying C such that the distance of W star to W prime is at most 1. And, you know, by that joke from last time, that implies that there exists a W prime satisfying C. Okay, so in other words, C is satisfiable. Okay, so that's basically the end of the proof because, well, these are the exact properties you want to show the NP completeness theorem, NP hardness theorem that uh, this problem is NP hard. In particular, if you had an algorithm that could distinguish between these two cases in polynomial time, you could solve circuit satisfiability in polynomial time by first running this reduction and then applying your supposed algorithm. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so that's a great theorem from the mid-90s. Uh, but now we're going to get greedier and say, that's very nice, but this is like, I mean, some unspecified constant. If you, you know, really dig into the guts of the proof, like maybe it's 10 to the minus 10 or something, um, it would be cool to make it like a big number, you know, <laughs> like a reasonably big number. Uh, so how big can we make delta naught? Oh, I should have said that like the delta naught here is exactly the lambda naught here. <coughs> um, well, there's an upper bound on this delta naught. Well, it's not going to be uh, bigger than one eighth. Why? Because there exists a simple, well, let me just say, there exists a poly time seven eighths one approximation algorithm for max E3 set. Okay, so it's not gonna, this, this is not going to be NP hard unless P equals NP, which is false. Uh, okay, and how, why is this the case? How do you approximate uh, E3 sets so well? Always get a 7 eighths fraction of the clauses. Well, here's the algorithm. Just output a random assignment. Oops. Okay, so ignore for, let me just say zero, 01. Ignore for a second the fact that this is a randomized algorithm. You see, if you just output a totally random assignment, then for any clause that looks like, you know, xi, maybe, or xj bar, or xk, maybe I should write f of this, the probability that the random assignment satisfies it is 7 eighths. There's only one unsatisfying assignment here. So uh, the probability it's sat is 7 eighths. So in expectation, this algorithm satisfies 7 eighths of the clauses. Okay, so if you're happy with a randomized algorithm and sort of an in expectation guarantee, then you're done. This algorithm gives it to you in expectation. If you're picky for some reason, then you can also easily de-randomize this algorithm. 
Okay, so there is a simple uh, algorithm that guarantees satisfying seven eighths of the clauses no matter what the instance is. In fact, this is a particularly ridiculous algorithm because, at least in the randomized version, it does not even look at the instance. You don't even need to see the instance. You're like, doesn't matter. Here's my solution. So uh, it looks like a very ridiculous algorithm. Uh, but, in fact, it's the best that you can do in polynomial time. And that's going to be our goal for our next class, to show that. Actually, let me just comment here that here we heavily relied on the fact that we were doing E3 sat, where all the clauses had exactly three, width three. If you just have three sat where they can have width two, then this thing is satisfied by a random assignment only with probability three quarters, which is worse. So in fact, it's still true that there is a seven eighths approximation for three sat, but it's like very, very hard, much harder than this randomized algorithm. Okay, anyway, as I was saying, uh, next class, we're going to talk about Hostad, well, a couple of Hostad theorems from the late 90s. And one of them is that uh, the following. For any constant epsilon greater than zero, it's NP hard to 7 eighths plus epsilon out of 1 approximate max E3 set. Okay, so you have this ridiculous algorithm that guarantees 7 eighths of the clauses and even on satisfiable instances, getting 0.876 clauses is an NP-hard task. Okay, so this is like a, a tight hardness of approximation result. Any questions about that? Statement? So uh, he proved several results along these lines. The other one we talk, we'll talk about is for E3lin. And here he showed for any epsilon greater than zero, it's NP hard to half plus epsilon out of one minus epsilon approximate E3 lin. <coughs> In other words, given a linear system over F2, all the equations have three variables. Even if I promise you that there is an assignment that satisfies 99.9% .9 of the equations, it's hard for you to find an assignment that satisfies even 50.1% of the equations. <coughs> yeah? Is this a strictly strong thing that it's hard to uh, one half plus epsilon comma one approximate? Uh, that's uh, worse than saying it's hard to a half plus epsilon one approximate. But in fact, this is not hard to do. You can do this in polynomial time. If I give you an instance of max E3 lin, sort of where the optimal value satisfies all of the constraints, actually you can do much better than 51%. You can find an assignment that satisfies all of them. Um, and we also know that like, no matter how satisfiable the instance is, you can always get a half just by outputting all zeros or all ones. So in some sense, you know, here it looks like there's two bits of slack, but this is also completely tight. You cannot improve this to a half, and you cannot improve this to one. Improve in the sense of prove a better hardness result. <coughs> okay, so these are some great theorems about the difficulty of solving basic uh, optimization problems. Um, Okay, what do I want to say about this? Okay, so uh, how does one prove such a result? Um, it's a bit complicated, but let me tell you about the ideas. So if you look back at this theorem, which I erased here, but was proving here, it was about showing hardness. Let's just talk about, for now, the three-side problem. Uh, it was about showing hardness of 1 minus delta 0 out of 1 approximating 3 sat. And the result that we got out of this PCPP theorem 
you know, said that this was NP hard for some like absolute universal constant delta zero. Uh, and where did that delta zero come from? As I said, it was exactly the the lambda. Yeah, it was the rejection rate in this PCPP system. <coughs> so you might have this um, well, actually, valid uh, instinct that you know to get a better delta zero, you should try and make this rejection rate bigger and bigger. So, cast your mind back. Where exactly did this rejection rate come from? Well, at least it's hard to say because this was the, the PCPP theorem with poly-length proofs. But if you look at our version of it, that had two to the two to the n length proofs. Uh, it came out of a property of the combination of tests that we used. And what tests do we use? Well, we used some stuff like local correction and so forth. But the main ingredient was the dictator test. I mean, that was the main driving force behind our PCPP reduction, the dictator test. And you know, ultimately, that was some combination of the BLR test and this arrows theorem, not all equal tests. And that's sort of where our lambda really came from. And so you will get the feeling, or you may get the feeling, that to get you know, better rejection rates in your PCPPs, and therefore better hardness results for CSPs, you should design better dictator tests that have like good rejection rates. Okay, so the idea, an, an idea is to get strong hardness results for CSPs. You try to design dictatorship tests oops, with like large rejection rates. And this idea is a good idea. Um, and it's due to uh, Bellari, Goldreich, and Sudan from around the mid-90s, maybe 94. <coughs> and it's just one component of the overall program. I mean, uh <coughs> oh, I should also, OK, let me add one more thing. In particular, If you want a hardness result for a particular constraint satisfaction problem, like the constraint satisfaction problem with predicate set psi, you want, ideally, a dictator test that uses constraints from psi. Remember, you know, a, a dictatorship test is really an instance, being a string tester, it's an instance of a CSP. And like, you know, in our, our proof of the PCP theorem in the 1 minus delta 0 approximation, I had to sort of tell you that their overall final string tester used disjunction predicates, OK? So if you're trying to, let's say, prove Hostad's hardness result for max E3 lin, you may think it's a good idea to try to design a dictatorship test with a large rejection rate where furthermore, the tester itself uses like three variable linear equation predicates. <coughs> so that's, OK, so getting back to my story, that's the right idea. Um, but it's not the only idea. You need to actually, just because you have a dictatorship test, you actually also have to build a PCPP reduction. And that, you know, even when we were doing it, that involved this local correction and other ideas. So you need a lot of other ingredients and somehow like, PCP technology. Uh, but basically, this idea of Bellari, Goldreich, and Sudan is a good one. And by combining it with PCP technology and like good dictatorship tests, they were able to prove, these guys prove something like uh, 0 0.974, 1 hardness for max E3 set. Okay, so instead of some totally unspecified constant, you know, their constant was like 0.026 or something. So 
that was pretty good. And they really did it by following this idea, combining some PCP technology with designing like a good dictatorship test. Okay? And so the contribution of Hostad was to take this, this idea and show that an appropriate variant of it could give you really good hardness results when, a pro when combined with some, again, appropriate PCP technology. So we're not going to talk really about PCP technology in this class. We're going to focus on the, the dictator testing aspect. <coughs> but the, the contribution of host died was um, to prove, you know, hardness results for like a CSP, like some particular one with predicate set psi. Suffice it to construct some kind of relaxed dictator test. Okay, and what does that mean exactly? Well, we'll get into it more in the next class, but in a normal dictator test, the way we defined it, you're you know, testing an unknown function. If it's a dictator, you should accept it with probability one. And ideally, with a large rejection rate, if it's sort of far from a dictator, if it's a little bit far from a dictator, you should try to reject it with large probability. And what Hossad showed is that it's enough to make a test which rejects with high probability when the function f is sort of very far from a dictator. Okay, so you're not so picky about which functions that you reject. You only really have to reject functions that are very much unlike a dictator. And because sort of you have to do less, you only have to reject the smaller class of functions, it's sort of possible for you to get a higher rejection rate and thereby get sort of a better hardness of approximation result. Um, so one thing he had to do is show that, you know, given dictatorship tests, even this relaxed kind, you could transform them into hardness results using some PCP technology. So we're not going to talk about that PCP technology. But we are going to zero in on the question of what exactly does this mean, a relaxed dictator test, and what are the best sort of parameters and rejection rates we can get for them, and how that corresponds to getting a hardness result. Because these days, if you have your favorite CSP and you want to prove a hardness result for it, the beauty is you can use this host technology or some other technology to reduce it just to a problem about like dictatorship tests and analysis of Boolean functions. So you don't need to know about PCPs and all this stuff. You'll just have like one theorem that says to get the hardness result you want, just design a dictatorship test with such and such properties. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, you kind of bypass it all together and like basically this relaxed dictatorship test, <coughs> you can also think of it as a CSP since it's a function tester or a string tester. And if you're trying to prove a hardness result for some predicate set psi, it'll be a CSP where the predicates are of this type psi. And you sort of use that test in a gadget reduction from some known NP complete problem. So Hostad basically shows how you can take this test, view it as like a gadget in this, the terminology of NP completeness reductions and stick it into like a known NP hard problem to get the desired hardness outcome. So I'll make it, we'll make it more clear next time, but let me just say one more word about, one more question. yeah, sure. Um, if you believe that you need games conjecture, then yes. Uh, that's a result from a few years ago. Uh, they're sort of necessary and sufficient. But if you don't, which is a valid belief system, if, uh, <laughs> then they're not.
Uh, okay, so next time what I'm going to do is define uh, what exactly this relaxed dictatorship test is, and then I'm going to sort of state as a black box this the theorem of Hostad that says if you have such a dictatorship test, then you immediately get a hardness result. And then, then we'll start using all our favorite ideas from Fourier analysis to design these tests. Uh, and while we're on the subject of unique games, uh, okay, so the, if you don't know it, this unique games conjecture is some notorious conjecture in complexity theory, which may or may not be true. Uh, but if it is true, then uh, you get sort of like a better and easier version of this Hostad uh, plan. So actually, if you really want to prove an NP hardness result, the Hostad says you have to do something that's even more complicated than construct a dictator test. You have to construct some weirdo version of a dictator test which I don't want to get into. But if you do believe this unique games conjecture, then it really suffices to just <coughs> construct a simple dictatorship test. So we're going to believe the unique games conjecture for the purposes of this course. And in a later lecture, we're actually going to see the reduction from the unique games problem to the hardness of approximation, assuming the dictatorship test. OK, so then if you believe it, you'll actually see the entire NP hardness proof based on dictatorship tests. OK, so let me just uh, say two words about this. So what's going on in this relaxed test? This is what we'll talk about next time. You still want to accept the dictators with high probability. But you only need to, you only want to reject with high probability Functions that have no, let me say, notable coordinates. And what does that mean? Let's say a coordinate i is notable if, well, a first uh, idea for how to make it define a notable coordinate is to say if its influence is at least some. Um, Know, number epsilon. <coughs> and that's a kind of reasonable definition, <coughs> but one thing that we don't really like about it is uh, it's possible that like a, a function can have all of its coordinates notable. Like if it's the parity function, then all of its coordinates have influence one, which is bigger than epsilon. So it doesn't really sort of jive with our intuition of notable. Like if you look at the parity, it's not like any of the coordinates are particularly special. They're all equally the same. Uh, so this is not the perfect definition of notability because you know, it's possible to have all your coordinates notable. So instead, the right definition, I forget if I exactly define this, is to uh, say that this noisily attenuated version of influences is, is large. Or this is a quantity that came up in our proof of the KKL theorem. This is instead of, OK, so this is the definition of influence, the sum of the Fourier weights that contain a coordinate i. And this uh, noisy version of it adds like an exponentially decreasing factor, okay, which sort of uh, gives less importance to the high degree terms. Okay? And so for example, with this definition, this uh, sort of attenuated influence, the parity function has very low sort of noisy influences because all of its Fourier masses at degree n, so you get this factor that's like 1 minus epsilon to the n, which kind of makes everything small. Uh, I'll talk about this more properly next time, but a cool thing about this definition, saying a coordinate is notable if and only if even its sort of noisy version of its influence is large, is that you can easily show for any function f, it has only a constant number of notable coordinates, where the constant is something like 1 over epsilon squared. Okay, so with this definition, you know, you can sort of generically pick out for a given function sort of the set of its important coordinates. And uh, you only have to reject in sort of Hostad's relaxed test those functions which have no important coordinates or notable coordinates. Okay, in contrast to a dictator where one of the coordinates has influence one. Okay, any questions? Okay, so see you on Monday.